Hello everyone, um, we are so happy to welcome you to this free masterclass today. Um, we will see how many people connect, but we already see that many of you are already here with us. So we will start no, not waiting really for, for others to join us. We I'm, hope they can join during the... I'm very happy that you are here, Adriana, because in a long time I'm not speaking English. And if we have to, speak, we have to explain everything that we have here with my English, this will be so difficult. Trust me, know? Jordi, even for me, sometimes <laughs> it's difficult because sometimes we make more... Um, more videos right in spanish sometimes in english so sometimes just switching one day um, to another sure. from one language to another it's also difficult for me don't worry. i promise that i will try to do my best thank <laughs> we, you Adriana. we both will don't <laughs> worry uh it will be just fine um so before we begin let me just uh, give you like a short summary uh, the, of the structure of this master class so that you know what to expect like um we expect the master class to last um, anything between one hour and a half two hours let's say depending also on the amount of questions that we will receive from you because last time we received a lot of questions live uh, so we will start explaining a little bit um, just like the title suggests science behind pastry. We will talk about food molecules and how they explain the textures of different pastry elabor elaborations. And later we will move on. Um, we will have a short break after this part of, of talking about science and molecules and pastry elaborations. We will have a short break during which we want to share um, a little video with you, a video that uh, talks about our project, our online school and online courses. After the, the pause, uh, and the, the video, we will explain a little bit the structure of our online course and some uh, some details about the online course, given that in one week, in less than one week, actually on May 9th, another edition of the online course starts. So if you'd like to, to sign up, we'll give you some information about, um, about the course. After that, we will present flan recipes. Yes, we will... Yeah. We're going to explain science through example. Exactly. So we will use a practical example to show you the traditional flan and the vegan flan reformulated using the B concept method. So we will uh, discuss the recipes in details. Jordi will walk you through all the steps, all the ingredients, so that you can really understand how did we um, how did we create this new vegan. Uh, B concept flan recipe, and at the end of the um, uh, of the masterclass, we hope to have like maybe something up to half an hour of time to answer your questions. So, should you have any any questions, some of them maybe will be answered during the masterclass while we explain. Sure. Um, but if they're not, uh, we will have uh, we will have enough time to answer them at the end of the masterclass. So this is basically the this uh, the structure of uh, of how. Uh, how we are going to do the master class and without further um, wait we can start mm -hmm. I think that we can start explaining why science is so important for 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 understand what we do Adriana no? because it's something that we that we explain in our course no and I think that before to start no explaining no why why science helps us to understand what we are doing no because sometimes what's happening in in pastry or pastry chef, no, me as a pastry chef is that uh, many years ago I was not connected to to was what I was doing. No, because was uh, there was no information, there was no people, professional pastry chef explaining this, and I think that we have to explain why it's so important to 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 link no science to pastry. I completely agree with you, Jordi. Um, I think that we sometimes don't have this, don't feel this connection, right? Maybe sometimes it's a joke and uh, people say, yes, in pastry, you have to measure every ingredient. So it's like chemistry or pharmacy, right? It's not like savory cooking where you can just improvise, yes. no? But even with those jokes about chemistry or, or the scientific part of pastry, we don't realize really to to what level the the, the science now is implied the chemistry and fit and both both chemistry and physics is implied in the creation of all the pastry elaborations that we do every single day chefs are working with what with emulsions but they might be working with emulsions like ganache or even emulsions like ingredients butter is an emulsion milk cream these are all examples of emulsions that a pastry chef sees and works with every single day and he might have 
he might not have um, the, the real deep understanding on how exactly emulsions are formed, no? or what kind of problems, how to fix some problems with the emulsions, or why certain emulsifiers work, and in, in the case of his elaboration, while others don't. So I think it's really, um, it, it's really interesting to show um, how deep is this uh, is this connection that two worlds between uh, the science world and the world and the the pastry world so we will start with some examples but just to to talk a little bit about the uh, the perspective of how things were and how things are or how we see them um i want to talk a little bit about the difference um when we look at pastry as a um, as a collection of recipes, now all that we see are ingredients, Jordi, wouldn't you? Sure. Wouldn't yeah, you say when I you don't... open any pastry uh, recipe book, all you can see is yes, recipes, recipes, and, and it, big, beautiful pictures. This is something that we love, pastry chef, but for sure recipes and, and pictures. That's and, it. Exactly, and you don't have you have list of ingredients, and sometimes you have this section where we explain how to work with butter or how to work with eggs no? or properties of whipping cream. What is the difference between whipping cream uh, at 35% of fat and whipping cream, I don't know, 30% of fat no? or 40% or, or of fat. Um, so we have some explanations regarding ingredients, but um, this for me is very limiting because it means that we can only work with butter, with, with, <laughs> with eggs, with white flour, let's say, and with white sugar, no refined sugar. And what happens if one day you want to substitute the, um, the uh, sugar for, I don't know, even erythritol, no, or any, any type of uh, sweetening um, agent that you choose? Mm -hmm. No, you replace, you switch it in your recipes and the recipe turns out different. Now the cookies are not crisp enough, for example, the, or they don't brown. If you use another a gluten-free flour and with the same temperature, they brown too, uh, too fast or they brown too little. Now you have all these changes and you don't understand what happened. You only understand that the substitution did not go well. Oh and the other day during the webinar, we were even joking because we said that uh, we will do once um, we will do just the master class just on pastry substitution ingredient substitutions yes because this is just one one thing that everybody asks about this you no know, how to substitute sugar how to substitute fats when you want to adapt for example the recipes to vegan recipes you no know, and you have like today we are going to explain you now that we have a, a classic recipe and we want to move this recipe to vegan and substitutions but we have to understand much more things than, than substitutions possible because if we don't understand the ingredients, it's so difficult you know, to, to move to another kind of ingredient if we don't understand the ingredients that we are using on the basic and classic recipes. Exactly. However, if we study pastry molecules, if we study food molecules in general, we get this deeper understanding on, of what exactly is going on in our recipes. And this can really help us uh, avoid mistakes, avoid, for example, broken, creamy or ganache textures, right? Over whipped meringues, mousses with scenarios. No, if we really study the food molecules, uh, then we can fix problems in our recipes. We can substitute ingredients and, and really create textures with, with any ingredients that we want. So we really wanted to show you this, this um, let's say, um, switch of focus, right? The focus on ingredients and the focus on pastry molecules. Like our approach focuses on pastry and food molecules because it really offers us a new perspective, a deeper understanding of what is going on in our recipes. So um, as you can see, you have the, the dossier. In the dossier, you will even find more information on the on pastry molecules and pastry techniques that we will comment on during the, the webinar. But just like you, you have um, um, stated on page nine in your dossier, uh, understanding both the molecular structure of your ingredients as well as the physical chemical processes uh, that happen um, in your recipes really allows you to build any texture, create any recipe that you want. And this is what we want to show you uh, today. So without, um, without giving you much more theoretical introduction, let's move on to some 
concrete examples of pastry elaborations because uh, for me this is this is really incredible jordi the fact that science answers almost any pastry almost, question almost everything uh, almost any question you have for example many times when you're doing any pastry recipe you're asking but why do i have to add this Mm, the sugar, let's say, three times when making a meringue, no? Mm -hmm. Or why do I have to heat the sugar syrup um, to 121 degrees or 180 degrees? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do this? So there's a lot of whys, mm -hmm. but mm, without the science, we cannot actually answer them because uh, without science, the only answer is because the recipe says well, so. It's like, it's because it's like that, no? And no? It's, Yes, I'm sure you That's... had some experience as when you started in pastry, you know, that you're doing something, but you are asking yourself, why am I doing it this way? No, it's just, if, I, if we think in the first recipe that I changed it, uh, trying to create something later, at the beginning of the creation of the big concept 10 years ago, was the lemon cream, you know, that I was using the classic recipe, but the, the classic recipe for me was not so interesting because we, we have it, uh, too much egg yolks inside and the egg taste was awful. And I decided to remove egg yolks without any uh, connection that I was removing my emulsifying agent of the recipe. No? And this was a problem because I tried to make the cream. The cream was only with egg whites, not with egg yolks. And I did the cream was I, the flavor and the taste was much more interesting because there was not the eggy taste. But at the end, when I freeze and I defreeze the recipe, I had a lot of water cooling down because I forget to, to use you know, that that lecithin that we have inside of yolk of yolks is necessary for create one emulsion that we have on the classic recipe. You know? But then you understand that, okay, okay. There is something that we are missing in this recipe that is one emulsifier. Let's go to add another emulsifier and make the recipe that. and see what's happened with one emulsifier. No? And like that, little by little, we started to understand everything that's happened in pastry. And this helps us to understand what is the way to create a structure. No? When we are working with fat and we are working with water, we understand that we need one emulsifier, no? because if not, we will not have stability in the recipe. And like that, we have to talk, we can talk, <laughs> we can about talk and talk so but, many examples. But it's, an, it's a perfect example to start with. That's why I wanted you to share it, because I, I know we, we talk about it very often now, but it's, I, I think this was like a defining experience for, me, for you, no? that like with this experience of, of not putting the egg yolks and seeing the recipe uh, not come out as you wished, uh, because some, some, at the beginning, for me, sorry, Adriana, was some people tell me that there exists emulsion. What was an emulsion, more or less, but uh, never nobody tell me that it's really something as simple that you have water, you have fat, and you need one, you need one ingredient that is going to connect you no know, one side to the other side. And in pastry, we use a lot of these ingredients, no? like for example, caseins, for example, lecithins, and for example, other emulsifiers that we use in pastry. No? And when you understand from this side, no? someone explained to you this, that is really simple. You understand that almost always you are producing emulsions in, in our job, no? in pastry, and it's really necessary to have stability. Exactly. And as you said, there are many more examples uh, that we, we could comment. We could practically take any pastry elaboration no? and, and analyze it, seeing what role do the food molecules play in it. So today we, we want to focus on three simple examples, some basic pastry recipes, like for example, <coughs> the sable dough. No, this is one of my favorites. I love sable dough. I love everything that is tarts and tartlets. And, um, and we can just, just with some simple questions, uh, we can analyze uh, how do we actually create the texture of this, the crunchy texture of the sable dough. Um, because when you start reading the, um, the recipe, the elab elab recipe elaboration process, Jordi, it says, for example, that you have to, um, you have the butter and you have mix. the flour and you have to mix the flour with the butter, no, using your hands. You can do it in the, 
um, in the standing mixer, but actually they really recommend the, yes, but this <laughs> the is, technique this is of unbelievable. mixing The it. first time yes. that I saw this was like, what's happened here, no? And Why they do it like that? Exactly. And it's actually this process in French, it's called sablage, right? So mm -hmm. it's like making, making the sand texture. But you are actually, when you, first time when you encounter this recipe, you are asking yourself, but why do I do this? Why do I need to mix butter with flour before adding before adding water, before adding any uh, mixing it with any other ingredient within the recipe? So actually understanding um, food molecules, understanding gluten, the two proteins that form gluten, gives us the answer to this question. What do we have in the flour? We have two proteins, glutenins and gliadins, that in the presence of water and in the presence of mechanical force, um, with the mechanical action, whether it's um, applied with the standing mixer or whether by hand or whether just just doing this, no, uh, those two proteins can form a gluten network. No, and the gluten network is what allows our dough to stretch. It gives it elasticity, which is very desired if we are making bread, if For we are sure. making brioche, if when we are it. making any other type of uh, of dough. But in the case of sablé dough. Why don't we don't want this elasticity? Mm. We don't want to actually roll out the dough and yeah. <laughs> and have it just come <laughs> short, no, like uh, go back to um, to its to being uh, a shorter, let's say, a less rolled out uh, texture. So we do we we put the um, fat and the flour together in order to prevent the flour from contacting with water that we have in the recipe because like this we prevent the gluten from formation so this is uh this is something that i understood only years after i learned to make um, sable dough in the culinary school because i just followed the process and the the pastry dough was always coming out nice but i didn't understand why you were doing that. exactly why is it really why it's so important to to put uh, the butter and the flour together like this no so this is one example um of the questions that we were we could ask ourselves regarding sable dough right uh, why do we add water last again for the same reason okay. we don't want the gluten network to develop so we will wait and add the water last and the butter that will be uh, around the flour particles will actually prevent will create a barrier so that the water and the flour don't mix and don't create this gluten uh, network. this gluten network exactly another question that we might ask um, regarding the sable dough jordi would be why can't we swap <laughs> butter for olive oil many people who start making mm -hmm. any sort of healthy recipes start by eliminating let's say animal fat and replacing it with um, mm. plant-based fat but what, what can happen in this case? No, what's happening is that we, under, we have to understand at the end that inside fat we have unsaturated, unsaturated fatty acids. And in general, if you think in pastry, we are working always with saturated fatty acids, no? For example, butter is it's contained inside the fat that we have is saturated, cream is saturated, egg yolks, almost all the fatty acids that we have are saturated. And that means that all these kind of fats that we are using saturated, there is a small part of unsaturated, but the, but the bigger part also in chocolate, for example, cacao butter, really rich in fat, uh, saturated fat. What's happening is that all this fat is crystallized and this, uh, this gives us a structure. No, if we are going to prepare a sable and we are using butter, we cannot just move uh, butter to olive oil because First, we have to understand that inside butter we have fat, saturated fat, fatty acids, unsaturated, and we have water. And we need these ingredients in order to have uh, to replace. No, that means that if we want to move to another fat, in this example, for example, olive oil, we will need okay olive oil in a percentage, but we will need also to work with a fat that will crystallize, no, rich in saturated, in saturated fatty acids like. Uh, cacao butter, coconut oil, in order to remove butter, but works with something similar and replace the quantity of water that we have on butter. No, this is this is the example with we can talk about crumble, really simple recipe where we have like four parts. No, we have flour, we have almond flour, we have sugar, and we have butter. If we want to make this recipe without gluten, 
First, we have to understand that in a crumble, uh, gluten is not necessary for the structure. We can create without, uh, with flour, a crumble and it's perfectly crunchy and it's interesting. Okay, because any crunchy, just like sable dough, right? Crunchy texture that is not supposed to to raise in the oven, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need it to, to actually um, double its volume, not like brioche, not like bread, mm -hmm. no, not like a, even even sponge cake. No, you don't need the um, the crumble to rise in the oven, then you that, really don't need yes, gluten proteins. No, that means that we can move to rice flour or another cereals flour, no? Uh, gluten is not, is not necessary for this kind of structures texture and then then when we are sugars the same we can change sugar for example if we are using white sugar we can move to coconut sugar there will be no big difference no because at the end the composition is quite similar but when we are raised to fat we have to think okay inside butter we have a part of fat this part of fat is saturated and then there is uh, a small part in saturated, and then we have water, and water is really necessary because if not, it's not possible to arrive to con to build the structure that we need at the beginning for a crumble because we need with the water, even the small quantity of water that we have in butter helps us to melt sugar and incorporate all the ingredients that we have on the on the on the on the recipe. No, that means that we have to replace water that we have in butter for water on the recipe. And then the fat that we have that comes from butter, we have to arrive uh, in a balance of different fats in order to have something similar. That means that if I want to use olive oil, okay, I'm going to change a part of olive oil, but I will try to, I will work also, for example, with coconut oil or with cacao butter in order to have, for example, in a sable, the same elasticity Mm -hmm. that we have with butter. Exactly. The, the plasticity, plasticity even we could say right because yes. elasticity is more with is, is more associated with the gluten proteins but we need this plasticity of the dough because what happens if we don't have an um, a fat that is, that can be spread that is spreadable mm -hmm. actually either the dough will break mm -hmm. now when we try to to put it inside of our tart mold so either it will start breaking and tearing and it will be a problem or um, it will start also another problem that could happen. Uh, it will just release a lot of oil, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of fat, yeah. no, outside mm -hmm. of yeah. the outside of the dough. So we will be left with some very greasy, oily texture. And so another, another parameter that is important to understand is the temperature, no, because it depends what temperature we are going to work. This no, it's like butter mm -hmm. because butter we we forget no that we work in a in a range of temperatures no in general in a in a production where we have production we have between twenty to twenty five degrees in general no that means that butter here in this range of temperatures is is flexible but still crystallized no exactly. if we are going to add oil maybe we will need to change the temperature of what. What temperature, At what we, temperature work, we, work? we work with this sable, no? And for example, the sable that we show to the course, no? The sable that we can see in the picture is a vegan sable. And we work with coconut oil and sunflower oil. And this, we just mix all the ingredients. We put between two, two, two silicon, uh, silicon leaf. And then, no, just we freeze. And then when we move to the freezer, we just cut and, and shape. This, the tart, no? Exactly, but at, knowing at, the... In a, in a special temperature. Exactly, knowing the specific. melting points yeah. of fats, no? Like, why do we need to study molecules? Because we need to know which, uh, at what temperatures do they melt, whether they crystallize, right? At what temperature do they crystallize? Just knowing the molecular structure of fats will give us some indication. We know that saturated fats uh, melt at a higher temperature, right? So we know that if we have and the polyunsaturated fats really, really melt at very low temperatures. So if we choose an oil, if we want to substitute butter for some oil with a very high percentage of polyunsaturated fats, 
we know that it will not work because it will not crystallize even at the temperature, at the fridge temperature, right? Mm -hmm. Walnut oil, for example, or hazelnut oil. These are types of oils that are very interesting from the from the nutritional point of view, from the flavor point of view. They are they are healthy, but at the same time, we yeah. cannot substitute 100 percent no, like this in the same ratio butter for hazelnut oil because we will not be able to roll out our sublet dough. So the, the studying the molecules in this case now we wanted to, to say what what is the role of fats in a uh, sublet dough. First it prevents the gluten the development of the gluten network. Second it actually um, it, it actually helps us create this crunchy texture by allowing us to work with the dough to roll it out and and to mold it no mm -hmm. at a um, and to crystallize uh, also. Um, the fat crystallization also helps us to, to, to later during the baking, no? like also have the, uh, the correct crunchy texture as a result. So um, I think this is for the, for the explanation, very short explanation, introduction into the, the molecules behind Sabledo. And we can maybe move on to a, a classic pastry elaboration like a meringue. Another day when we were doing the, a webinar in Spanish. We actually had so many questions about the meringue. We said we might yes. one day decide to do just the webinar about the science of the meringue. Yes, because, <laughs> because it's something as simple, but at the same time, we have so many questions about meringue, no? And you see exactly. a lot of recipes that are not so well balanced, no? Because sometimes we are using ingredients on the same recipe that are, no? Or one or the other one, no? And you see that we are using both, no? I mean, it's the I mean, connection with science that we've arrived to this. Exactly. If we think about the meringue, the meringue can be done with just two ingredients. Mm. But there's so much actually science behind it, right? Because those two ingredients, if you think uh, we have just egg whites and sugar, now the classic meringue, whether French, whether Italian, whether uh, Swiss meringue, unless we really start to substitute for polyols or for other sweetening agents, or unless we we want to work with aquafaba instead of um, instead of egg whites, we really just just have two simple ingredients. So what happens if we only talk and understand the ingredients? Then we are working with the meringues, just let's say understanding that okay, or following the traditional process, which is like first beat the egg whites until they foam. When you have the foam, add sugar in three parts, <laughs> and this is something Jordi that always fascinated me, um, because uh, why three parts? I was always like wondering why do we why do we have to divide sugar into three equal parts, and why cannot we add the sugar all at once? And actually, here at Jordi Border School, we always add sugar all of it all at once, once. but why is it because but actually just knowing about the the pastry molecules the uh, helped me understand why the traditional recipe says to add it in three parts it's basically because the amount of sugar is sometimes so it's, big it's the difference between for example a classic daquas mm -hmm. that we can see that in some of recipes we have like 40 percent of the daquas that we showed in the course no that we prepare that are that was that has between 15 to 18 percent of sugar no and <laughs> you understand everything no because you have such amount of water inside of the equites if you have to introduce 40 percent of sugar or 20 percent of sugar it is is half part no for this reason you need to make inner steps no exactly because if not all the foam that you have already created right you 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 really um, we always start now like foaming, uh, beating the, whipping the egg whites a little bit. You want a little bit of foam and then you want to add sugar and you want to create more foam. No, why do we, uh, what does sugar help with? Basically, sugar also helps us create more viscosity to the, to the liquid that we are whipping. No, this helps because later the viscosity, the, the, let's say the thickness of this liquid is important for in order for the gas bubbles that are trapped inside not to go and burst and right like so to, to keep them in there in this meringue uh, structure we need viscosity so sugar helps us with that um, but 
if we add if we have a big amount of sugar and we add it all at once then maybe it will be really we will we will need much more time and it will be much mm -hmm. much more difficult scraping the sugar from the bowl and having to stop no many and times for the, for the proteins and for the water that we have on the it will be much more difficult to bring all the sugar and on the melting point no to be exactly to the to actually to dissolve no in mm -hmm. order to for the sugar to dissolve it would it will be much harder but in case of our recipes, as you will see in any example on our on our blog or in those master classes, no, we add sugar at once, but this is because we add less sugar. Our meringues do not contain as much sugar as traditional meringues, so we actually can add them all at once. But talking about those, those um, meringue myths, let's say, Jordi, there are many more myths, right, about how you should do the meringue a myth a, a common myth is that you have to add sugar in three parts another common myth for me is for example that you should add uh, acid or salt to the meringue mm. right in mm. order or maybe even that you should uh, whip it in a copper bowl <laughs> and each of those myths some of them are founded in real scientific explanation you no know, and they have some reasoning and some of them are just pure myths that maybe um that just like someone made a recipe and it it worked for him or or that he wrote it down and then other people were just copying this mistake and copying this mistake no because what happens there is a, this myth of adding salt to in order to help the proteins uh, actually come together you now and create the the bonds between them um just a quick uh let's say quick explanation scientific explanation what is the structure of a meringue meringue is actually created egg whites are, are an incredible <laughs> ingredient with over 10 different types of proteins we often think that like egg whites well they contain proteins okay but we're not always conscious that there are 10 different types of proteins and we all we always say oh yes of albumin no but of albumin is just one example of the of the egg white proteins we have and that is the most abundant 50 percent of the proteins we find in the egg whites is of albumin but there are other proteins and each of them participates let's say in the uh, can participate in the creation of a meringue structure so what happens is the proteins in their in their native state so in in how we find them in the in the egg whites now they are like those uh, very long chains of amino acids and um, and they are really all like uh, bundled up like this like very tight no and with the um, with the application of mechanical force no they start those very long chains start to open up they start to actually um, open up into those long no um, not lines, but let's say chains, long no? chains, exactly, long chains of, of proteins. And then because um, they create different bonds between the respective protein chains no, and be between the respective amino acids. So the creation of these bonds, right, helps uh, be, because of the creation of the bonds, the air is trapped, the air bubbles are trapped inside and we actually get the meringue as uh, the meringue structure in this way um so what happens when we add acid or when we add salt to the to the meringue no initially salt or acid or any any of those ingredients like uh, cream of tartar right which is an acid, acid um any of those ingredients recommended to add during the the creation of the meringue what they the objective uh, of adding them is to help the proteins actually unfold now mm -hmm. this is the unfolding and folding of proteins is what makes the meringue structure but we can add salt and yes initially maybe our proteins will unfold faster so we will see the whipping process is faster so this is how i think the myth or the mistake was born you can see the foaming happening faster so you think aha uh -huh, this is a perfect way to create a meringue but what happens next after we have the meringue already with the sugar and the meringue structure form the salt will actually attract all the water from the egg whites right through the through osmosis like it will it will really make the water come um, come to it and as a result if we just leave this meringue sitting for for five minutes we will see water seeping out of the meringue so the question is maybe for the um maybe the salt can help in the initial whipping process mm -hmm. but in the long term uh, as far as the meringue stability is concerned it's really more 
destructive than, <laughs> than helpful. So we shouldn't really add salt to our meringues. The... That, that, that means that when we are going to prepare a meringue, we need to think that maybe the first ingredient that we will need will be acidic ingredient, not like, for example, cream of tartar or lemon, lemon exactly. juice, for example, Adriana. It's much, it's much <laughs> better because the, um, the acid has two functions and both are very interesting. So first of all, it helps with the unfolding of proteins. So mm -hmm. as as we said before, this is this is basically the goal from the from the very tight, you know, like folded chains. We want to un we want them to unfold to be able to trap, to make bones and trap air, air bubbles. But um, so first, acid, just a couple of drops of lemon juice or cream of tartar or uh, any other type of acid allows the proteins to unfold faster, and then. Um, it actually prevents from too many bonds, too many strong covalent bonds to form between the protein chains. And why is that important? Uh, I'm sure that anyone, any pastry chef uh, has the experience of over whipping the egg whites, whether because they because of working with the fresh egg whites that sometimes get over whipped very easily, very nice. right? Or because um, we had many things going on and we just left the egg whites to to whip and whip and whip and when we come come back to see the standing mixer, it's already um, it's over whipped and then we have to start over and it's and it's really um, it, it's really a common problem for any pastry chef. So actually, adding just a little bit of uh, of acid helps prevent the over whipping of the meringue. In what way? Um, during the whipping, the mechanical force will also forces the protein chains to come together and create those bonds. So the more mechanical force we apply, the, the tighter, let's say, those bonds will be, the tighter the network will be, because we, now what we have while we are uh, whipping the, the egg whites with sugar is a protein network. But the more time passes, the more mechanical force we apply, this network becomes like tighter and tighter and with more bonds created and can be eventually become so tight that the, the air and the water and is exactly is, ex um, is expelled outside and we have kind of a, like a broken texture to um, a meringue that, that really doesn't look uh, nice and soft anymore. So in this case, the acid prevents too many bonds, too many covalent bonds from forming and this allows us as a result to whip the, the meringue without having this, this over whipped texture and to have a more like a softer, more flexible uh, texture of a meringue, which which is very important when we make a mousse, Jordi, wouldn't you For say? Example, yes, we need flexibility. You now we have to think if we can say a definition of a meringue is a structure aerated that is flexible no? in order to introduce the air uh, in a way lighter no? and slowly inside of an emulsification in general. And if, for example, we have a meringue that is so too strong, no, not so flexible, we are going to lose all the air that we have inside of our meringue. No? For this reason, it's very important to understand the texture that we have on the part of the emulsification and the texture that we have on the meringue. And even if we have air in one part and not air inside, both textures need to be similar, no? With the same viscosity, we can say, in order to don't lose the, the air that we have inside of the meringue. This is a classic problem that we have a lot of times, that we have a meringue that is perfect, and then we have the part of the emulsion that is too liquid. Mm -hmm. And we mix both preparations and we lose all the air. No? And this is because we needed more viscosity on the on the emulsification part. And this can be on the other side, no? A meringue with not enough dry extract on the meringue preparation, no? And too light, just when we're going to mix with the part of the emulsification, we, we will see that at the end of the mixing process, we will have like bubbles of air on escaping. top. <laughs> the, the, it's air that says, bye bye, hello. I'm going to move to another slide, no? And this is, we are going to lose all the air, that bubbles of air that we created with the meringue, no? For this reason, we need to understand, no? How, how important it is to balance both texture in order mm -hmm. to have a perfect, then a perfect texture of a moss, for example, or a sponge also. Exactly. And 
Um, I already see that there are questions regarding the meringue coming in, so we're very happy. We will answer them at the end of the uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, but just like just like Jody said, and just like we said before, there are so many things to understand about the meringue. For example, another question that we have here um, is why different sugars give us different results when we make a meringue, right? We can make a meringue with what? We can make a meringue with uh, regular sugar, uh, saccharose. We can make a meringue with fructose. We can make a meringue with dextrose. No, we can make a meringue with then erythritol or xylitol. And we will get a completely different result. First of all, in terms of sometimes in terms of taste, maybe because we know that some sugar alcohols have this um, refreshing, like um, uh, after refreshing yes, metallic metallic. aftertaste. So and but not just that, not just taste of sweetness. Sometimes, obviously, if we're working with with some sugar that are you now with glucose or fructose, they will have different sweetness than um, they might have different sweetness than sugar. And we will also have the, the, the change of sweetness. But we, we can also have even or observe the change in volume. Right. Mm -hmm, Jenny, for like sure. We can have um, when we you can... have sugar, for example, that has more or less water catchment capacity, you see meringues that are no more or less volume. No, for example, two ingredients that it seems that they are the same, no, that is glucose and dextrose, and you prepare one meringue with glucose and one meringue with dextrose, maybe 50% of meringue and 50% of egg whites, 50% of glucose one side, 50% of egg whites, 50% of uh, dextrose in the other side. You whip, you whip, you whip exactly the same, same temperature on the egg whites. You add the sugar at the same time, and you see that you have completely two different volumes. And this is because, for example, glucose, we have a much more water catchment capacity than dextrose. That means that uh, the more water catchment capacity we will have, the more difficult will be for the proteins to open, no, and to have a, a, a lighter structure, no. And when we are using, for example, dextrose, we see that dextrose doesn't have too much uh, water catchment capacity, and we have a meringue that is much, much more fluffy, much more, no, with more overrun. Exactly. No. When you refer to glucose, you mean the glucose dextrose equivalent, for example, 40, 40 right? Because 40, yes. <laughs> because just not to not to confuse, right? Because when we say dextrose, technically it's also glucose, yes. but it's uh, the dextrose not... equivalent 100. No, but mm -hmm. if we look, if we if we use um, if we compare the the glucose with dextrose equivalent 40. It's more, it's more, it's a little more closer to, to being a fiber, right? It's so it has greater water catching capacity. So that's why the difference in volume. Uh, and, there's and, and there is much more difference. No, you have glucose, less sweetness. No, you have the glucose equivalent one hundred. We have exactly. more, big, big more sweet, in sweetness. More, more sweetness, and then we have anti freezing capacity. No. And dextrose has a high anti-freezing capacity. That means that if we are going to prepare, for example, a mousse with dextrose no, inside, mm -hmm. with a meringue with dextrose, we will see that even on the freezer at minus 20 degrees, you touch your mousse and it's completely soft. No? And you think what's happening? The freezer is not working. And it's only just because we have two different ingredients with two different capacities. And this is, no? Yes, it's it's... Uh, everything changes by substituting ingredients and it's really amazing when we learn why when we learn about um, sugar um, solubility when we were when we, we learn the molecular structure of different sugars now actually when we understand the molecular structure of starch we understand perfectly why glucose dextrose equivalent uh, 40 is so different from dextrose, but we really need to dive deep into the, the molecular structure of those ingredients to, to understand why. Um, another example could be, um, just like you said, Jordi, the, the volume changes also, and um, some other things can change regarding, uh, the, depending on the solubility of sugar, mm -hmm. right? For example, we had this experience, we like, we can work with erythritol in meringues, but we have to keep in mind that it's much less soluble than regular sugar. So if we're working with, with erythritol at the room temperature, we can end up with a meringue with actually sugar, the, those polio uh, sugar crystals, because it does not dissolve well 
well at 20 degrees. So if we don't heat the, um, the egg whites during the whipping process now to a, a high enough temperature without also coag applying too high temperature, not to coagulate them. But if we don't, um, if we don't make sure that the erythritol dissolves properly, we will have a meringue with a quite a disagree disagreeable um, texture with, with those sugar crystals. Um, I think, uh, thank you so much, Erika, for your questions. We will, uh, we will go back to them because we saw already two very interesting questions about the meringue. And I think at the end, we will mm. uh, we'll have enough time to, to answer all of your doubts. And these are very good, valid questions. Um, so moving on, let's move on to choux pastry, Jardi, another classic elaboration that, um, that any pastry chef, I think, had a... Um, had a chance to work with during his pastry career. I know you have, <laughs> I have, uh, Jardi. Uh, but there are also, for me also, the, the elaboration process of shoe pastry was always a mystery a little bit. Like why, for example, we need to change temperature at the pastry shop I, I worked at, even the temperature had to be three different temperatures for the beginning of the baking process, for the middle of the baking process, and for the end of the baking process. And I really, I couldn't understand why no, or I couldn't, I was fascinated a little to understand how does the, the texture of a shoe develop? How do we end up with this hollow inside of the... Mm -hmm. Of the shoe pastry jardi like this is this is kind of magic but but if we understand um the science as, behind as the, as the only dough that we have in pastry that produce this kind of big hole inside no exactly there is not other doughs that work in that direction and eh? something incredible that's right and um and really it's by studying food molecules that we understand how this hollow uh, is formed because in the end um, the shoe uh, the shoe pastry has a lot of eggs right there's always like really we're usually adding five or six uh, you no know, eggs fresh eggs to the to the dough so um, just like we said before the eggs have proteins but they also for example egg whites are 88 percent of water so we're actually putting a lot of water uh, into this uh, dough disguised as eggs right this is something uh, really fascinating we we don't have um enough time to talk about all the um, amazing properties of water but we can just we cannot stress it enough water is the basic pastry ingredient that no one talks about in mm. no pa no pastry book have i found a chapter de dedicated to water in pastry no because they talk no milk in pastry cream in pastry but actually we have to think that um, oftentimes our primary ingredient in many pastry elaborations is not flour, it's not sugar, it's water. <laughs> and in this case, if we calculate the amount of water we put into the shoe pastry, it's really a significant amount. And during the baking, what happens to this water? Thanks to the, the elasticity, both of gluten proteins, but also the egg proteins, no? And like they, they, um, the, the network that we have, right, the gluten network, for example, expands uh, together with the egg proteins. Now it has some elasticity because the water turns into vapor with the heat and the water tries tries to escape. So actually it's the, the pressure of this, of this water inside the dough that is turning into vapor and that is uh, pressing on the walls of our shoe dough, like making it bigger. And, and why does it end up being, being hollow inside? Because eventually, the proteins with the high temperature that we use during the baking, the, the proteins will coagulate, the dough will become firm and crispy, and, and the water will, will just evaporate and it will leave this hollow, um, this empty. hollow inside, empty part inside. So um, we can think it's magic or we can just think this is just water changing its physical state, first being added as, as water and then changing into vapor. And, and then basically the dough cooking with this, with this hollow eva water evaporating and, and leaving us with this nice um, hollow texture. Uh, what else, uh, what other questions do we have regarding shoe pastry that we can answer, Jordi? Um, why, yeah. is it, why is it so difficult to make vegan <laughs> shoe pastry? Because I'm sure some of our- You, some... you just read my mind. <laughs> This is something unbelievable. We did a lot of tests, eh? because yeah. when, I, when we think in vegan chou paste, no, yeah. in vegan chou, is that I'm thinking in something that is 
really similar to the one that is not vegan, no? I mean, no, it's not something that it's similar and we remove everything that we have inside because there is no hole, no? Uh, it's quite, it's crazy, no? We've been doing a lot of tests in order to have a vegan, a vegan chew, but a vegan chew uh, perfect. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, until now was not possible, no? For this reason, the picture that, that we can see on the, uh, on the presentation is the, uh, the chew that we created without gluten and without lactose. That is almost- There's already a challenge, it's, but- It's a challenge, but- Proteins of eggs are really necessary in order to build this empty structure. No, it's not just water that is creating this vapor no, mm -hmm. inside in order to, to develop the, the shape. It is also the proteins that they are working very hard in order to build the structure. No, and since now it was not possible to find just a, a recipe that we can just remove all these ingredients and work with that vegan ingredients and to have something. Uh, similar, similar yes. in a structure, texture, and, and flavor. I'm really curious to see, Jordi, if in you know in the coming upcoming years we will have uh, such good um, plant-based ingredients available that it will really be absolutely possible to create vegan shoe because there are vegan shoe versions. But I want to to explain the difference. They are made with baking powder, no baking powder, and without and the eggs. Let's say we can replace them with water. But what happens if we have a lot of water? and baking powder like yes it will actually rise in the oven but then but it will then, collapse oh, yeah. because there will not be this this protein uh, network the elasticity of egg proteins to actually to allow it to expand and then to coagulate and to cook at a certain texture right so um so there so then their solution is put less water and obviously there are recipes shoe recipes vegan shoe recipes that work well with less water, baking powder, but what happens then? There is no hollow inside, and actually you have to cut it. You have to uh, take the dough out there. Yes, they are. They, they they can be interesting or they can be functional, but I'm not sure if we can really call it shoe pastry <laughs> because uh -huh. they don't have the the characteristic no hollow inside. So um, this is another another way just to illustrate how science helps us answer the the question no the, the all these why questions why vegan pastry uh, vegan shoe pastry uses baking powder simply because there's there's nothing else that helps the shoe rise in the oven so they they really need to put the um the baking powder but is it the same the texture not really because without the proteins without the coagulation and the the cooking of the proteins at a certain texture um we don't get we we don't get the same the same texture uh, I think, uh, what else? Why do you need to freeze the shoe dough before, the, or the shoe pastry, um, the shoe dough actually, before baking? That's another question that is uh, quite interesting because um, I, we, we receive here now at, at, at our pastry school, we receive some questions like, oh, why does my shoe pastry um, end up flat? No? <laughs> or why, uh, why do I have this problem with the crackling, no? the, the crunchy, let's say, that we have on top of the shoe pastry in order to make it more attractive, just like you can see on the picture. Um, so to answer this question, like it's also the science or the knowledge on, on about food molecules and their properties, their molecular structure and their functional properties also allows us to understand why is it preferable to freeze the shoe dough. If we don't freeze, we make a imagine Jordi, we make a crackling, we have with a lot of fat, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And then we put it on top of the shoe and we just put it in a very, very hot oven. No? What will happen first? Well. <laughs> it's fats like are going to melt it fats are going before. to melt very quickly right at a high temperature fats are going to melt very quickly they will just slide off the the shoe dough and they will make like a pool around the the, um, the dough and they might even start burning for example if you mm -hmm. made the crackling with butter mm -hmm. at those temperatures it can even if you put the warm shoe um shoe dough with the crackling it can start you know even easily uh burning so this the, the freezing helps us actually to have the the shoe um, texture develop slowly, right? Mm -hmm. The fats in the crack land to because melt slower. As on the structure, we have fat, we have proteins. When we introduce the shoe, I'm thinking, just I'm thinking on the oven, uh, you start to melt the side parts of the shoe. That means that this part starts 
to develop, you know, fats they are going to start to be melted, but proteins they start to, to create the structure. And at the same time, the more time, you no, know, it's it's you no, know, it's on the oven, the more this structure develop little by little, but in order. You know, exactly, I, I in a mean, controlled way, yeah, not not yes. just like because also Mm, if we put too high, too high a temp, to high temperature, even this this um, water, no, this water that turns into vapor, it can burst. It mm. can break the, mm. the the shoe texture, no, and just burst out. So it's really it's really good to have this progressive cooking and to have the the texture develop um, more slowly in a more controlled way. Um, I'm very happy because I see that today the questions are very connected with what we're explaining. And there's another question from Erika about the gluten-free uh, shoe pastry. We will go back to that. And just to tell you, we do have in our online course, we do teach you to make this um, Paris breast gluten-free elaboration that you can see mm -hmm. on the picture um, that we are presenting. Um, moving on, just to let you know that uh, we, today we are just really touching the, the surface of what food molecules bring us and um, what the knowledge of food molecules can bring us um, to developing, changing and uh, really succeeding at our recipes. But uh, in your dossier on pages 11 through 14, you have some, let's say, a little more details about each of the pastry molecules that we were uh, that we were talking about today, water, lipids, proteins, sugars, starch, fibers, so that you have like a very short introductory um, introductory text in order to uh, to understand the importance of this molecule uh, in pastry. Uh, we also focus on pastry techniques and maybe now, Jordi, we will finish this first theoretical part, mm -hmm. talking a little bit of how um, how the techniques help us build textures, because I always like this comparison well, first, you have to learn about molecules. Molecules, let's say, are, if you think about the theater play, molecules are the characters, mm -hmm. right? They are the characters of your theater play. But then the techniques, it's actually the, the, how they interact, yes. right? You have the characters talking <laughs> to each other, characters that do not want to stand in the same room with each other. You really, um, so these are like molecules in action. Now you really put them together and they interact in a very different way giving you very different results um, as a consequence. So what we, we were explaining now about the emulsification, you have water, you have fat, but then you need you no know, uh, emulsifier, emulsi we, you need friction, you need to, to control the temperature, you need a time of a friction in order to create a perfect emulsification. No? That means that it's a complex process that we, in general, in pastry, we do uh, without no connection because we are preparing for example creme anglaise and we are doing all this process but we sometimes we forget that we control the temperature in a creme anglaise uh, we are using water we are using fat we are using water inside exactly. because we have milk we have cream we have egg yolks but inside of all these ingredients we have water no that means that we are using the proteins and and the, prote the proteins that we have for example on the dairy products water and fat in order to create a perfect emulsification in a one temperature with a mixing you know, process during all this process. You know? And sometimes we forget that all these steps are very controlled, even if we don't know. You no, know? And for sure, we have to understand molecules, we have to understand ingredients, and the next step is to understand the techniques that we are using in order to create the structures that we need in pastry, you know, like for example, a mold, like a sponge, like a creamy, like a compote, any kind of, of textures. Exactly. I'd really like um like you Jordi to a little to expand on, on, on this thing because um it's what we said at the beginning. Now every day pastry chef making recipes, he's working with the emulsification technique, but maybe he thinks about it while making a ganache because maybe the elaboration process specifies like emulsify with a hand blender, no? But there are plenty of other um, moments where we where the recipe doesn't say like, okay, now thicken your, thicken your recipe with this or this, no? But all these techniques are implied in the creation of those textures. So we prepared what we prepared for you today is a little, um, a little graphic. A graphic illustration of how the techniques 
help us build textures. Mm -hmm. So if you... We can start explaining the first texture, no? the, the first kind of texture that we have no idea or compote is a preparation with fruits and sugars, we can say in an easy way. And in general, we have ingredients that helps us to, to set. No? We can use, for example, gelatin, we can use, for example, pectin. And if we think in techniques, we have to know that jelly or jelly compote, we are going to use gelation technique. That means that gelation technique is related to, for example, gelatin or agar-agar, for example, or pectin. No? They are ingredients that they are going to help us to create this, this texture. Then we have to see if we need thickening. No, it's another technique that we can use in a in a gel, for example. And thickening is more related, for example, sugars. No, as a dry extract, give a thickening effect on the recipe. But we we relate this to a specific ingredients that give us thickening. No, like for example, gums, like for example, uh, fibers. Wargam, uh, Chantan gum, uh, Locus gum, the, that are gums that they are going to help us to create uh, thickening on the recipes. The combination of both is almost the, the more important players on the recipe that they are going to give us the texture and the structure. No? That means that a recipe without gelation or sometimes a recipe a recipe without thickening, they, they are not working. We are going to freeze, we will have water cooling down. No, And this is because maybe we need to increase gelation or maybe we need to increase thickening or maybe we need more dry extract on that recipe. No, Then here we have like two different techniques, gelation, that we are going to create a network. No, we can say in exactly. order to trap water inside of the of the structure or thickening that are ingredients also like starches, for example, that they absorb water. No, they start to absorb water, and they are the more we add to the recipe, the more water we can say that they absorb. The more thick is the texture. No, and it's two different functions. No, one thing is gelation, another thing is thickening, and we have to understand perfectly this. Two, two techniques in order to create a compote. Then if we move to a creamy texture or ganache, for example, is, is something similar than, for example, compote, but we have to add another technique, emulsification. Why this? Because we have fat inside. That means that on the first uh, kind of texture, gel or compote, we have just water, sugars, fibers, some proteins, a small amount of fat, less than, for example, 1%. And here we need like gelation and thickening. But when we move to, to a creamy or to a ganache of this kind of textures that doesn't have air inside that contains fat inside, here we need emulsification in order to bring together uh, fat and water. And water. And what's happened if we are not using emulsification? What's happened is that this recipe is going to be not stable, for example, for the freezing and thaw process. No? That means that in, in a recipe that we have uh, fat and water and the emulsion, we don't have emulsifier, or maybe the emulsion is not on the right process. I mean, the right temperature, the right uh, time of friction, Maybe we are going to freeze and thaw this recipe, and we will have also water cooling down. No, and we can say we can see that more uh, ingredients interact on the recipe. The more techniques we need in order to create a stability and build the uh, and build the structure. Exactly. Like I think that what you referred to, right, Jordi? We have another masterclass about it. If you're interested more to know more about the scenarios, no, this water mm -hmm. coming out of seeping out of the uh, of the entremets after it's being frozen and defrosted, it's really something that many pastry chefs have encountered, and they absolutely they don't know what does it um, right why did um, this problem occur they often think oh okay maybe i need to put more gelatin or more agar agar and then the result is even worse or but it's a it's a really complex um phenomenon that has to do with for example how many techniques with the good use of the techniques now and the application of um certain techniques 
to obtain good stability. Now, later, of course, it's also related with the amount of dry extract, later with the, the, the type of ingredients that you're using. No, because some are more, for example, some gelling agents are more prone to scenarios like agar-agar and or gel, even gelatin, and some are less prone uh, to scenarios like pectin. So I also advise anyone who is interested in the um, in the topic to check out the masterclass on scenarios because we did um, we did that one and um, and I think it can be useful to really understand uh, because I remember Jordi that there we also focus a lot about how the textures help us specifically with the stability um, of the recipes but I'm I'm sorry I, I cut no, you no, in the middle of no, no, this, of this presentation um, and then if we move for example I move or oh, there's no textile that contains air inside here we need to work with a combo of all these techniques no we need gelation to set water maybe we need thickening in order to have for example uh, the right viscosity on both parts of the recipe in order to have a perfect uh, final texture, no, is what we were explaining about mousse, no, that if you have, for example, a emulsification that is too liquid and a meringue that is too thick, when you are going to mix, there will be, uh, no, the bubbles of our meringue, we are going to lose it, no, that means that it's a balance between gelation, thickening, uh, emulsification, if we have fat, for sure, but the main technique here is aeration, because we need to introduce air, and in pastry in general, we use like two ways we can say to in general to introduce air. One is whipped cream, no, that is a, an stable emulsification that we add air inside. And then we have meringues, no, that means that we have like two different two different ways in order to introduce uh, air inside and create a perfect structure like. For example, mousses or even sponges, no, is is the same. No, we are going to use eggs in order to introduce, for example, eggs inside, air inside, or, or other kind of uh, airy agents. No, we can say yeah. airy yeah. or foaming agents. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. That means that to create the, the structures, we have to understand the different techniques that we uh, that we have and play with you know, these different techniques, these different ingredients that are related to the techniques in order to have, for example, a perfect creaminess in a mousse, a perfect stability in a gel or compote, or for example, a ganache that are flexible in order to pipe in the right sense. No? That's um, that's very right, Jordi, and I think we could continue with, with this explaining the texture and yeah. techniques for many more uh, for many more hours. Uh, but we want to. Um, but in you, if you want to know more about the techniques, please take a look later at page thirteen or fourteen in your dossier, uh, masterclass dossier, because you will find some some information on the additional information there. And right now we will make a short uh, pause in in our before moving on to the practical case to the study of the practical case and the flan recipe the traditional flan and the uh, big concept vegan flan recipe so during this pause we want to share with you the video and present a little bit our educational project our online course because the foundation of this course is actually the knowledge of pastry molecules and pastry techniques in order to be able to create your own recipes so please stay with us we will, uh, after the video, we will continue with a short presentation of the course and then move on to flan recipes and answering your questions. Hi, I'm Jordi Bordas, World Pastry Champion and the creator of the V Concept Method. Together with my team, I have created a unique online pastry course. Everything started when I was 14 years old, working in my parents' bakery. With time, I discovered that pastry was my language, my way to communicate and express myself. With a lot of training and experience under my belt, in 2011, I won the World Pastry Championship. And this was a very special moment that became a turning point in my life. After becoming World Pastry Champion, I realized I wasn't free creating in my recipes. And I started following a healthy lifestyle. 
But my recipes did not reflect that. I understood that the world has changed, but pastry remained the same. I started studying each recipe. I needed the freedom to create my recipes, and I needed a method. I spent a lot of time investigating ingredients and techniques, looking for answers to my questions. And this was the beginning of the concept method. A method to create healthier, lighter, and tastier recipes from scratch. In 2015, I opened my pastry school in Villarecans, where we have taught the method to more than 1,000 students. In 2020, we opened our R&D center and created this unique online course. Now you can take this course. We introduce you to the online extended version of the B Concept course. In this course, composed of four different parts, you will learn how to formulate and create your own pastry recipes. In the first part, you will learn everything about water, fats, proteins and carbohydrates, the molecules that make up all our ingredients. Knowing their physicochemical and functional properties will give you the knowledge that you need to work with any pastry ingredient. Through the second part, you will be able to master emulsification, aeration, thickening and gelation. Four techniques that are essential for creating perfectly balanced pastry textures. In the third part, you will learn how to formulate recipes using the Big Concept method. We will show you over 30 practical cases and give you the keys to create healthier, lighter and tastier recipes. In the last part, we will show you step by step how to execute a collection of pastry creations. We will give you many practical tips so you can apply them in your daily work. The course includes more than 40 hours of videos, a theory book of over 300 pages and countless recipes. You will also be able to participate in forums and live webinars to solve all your doubts and interact with other students. You will put your knowledge to test with different assignments and self-evaluation tests, and by completing them, you will earn your training certificate. But don't worry, we will guide you and help you all along the way. If you love pastry and want to understand all the processes and reactions behind your recipes, this is the course you have been waiting for. It is a perfect course for any pastry chef wanting to share their values through their creations. Maybe you want to redesign and adapt your recipes so that they fit better your customers' needs. Or you need to balance your recipes resolving any stability, texture or taste issues. And if you are looking for a course to learn how to save time and resources, look no more. To take the course, you only need a device with internet connection, pen, paper, and a desire to learn. Throughout this course, we will give you all the tools that you need to become independent at creating your own pastry collection. Master the Big Concept method and tap into your infinite creative potential. You will be surprised at what you can achieve once you complete this course. Come and join us. Okay. Welcome again. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this short presentation of our course. And now we want to present it a little bit in detail, um, not taking a lot of time, just uh, five minutes. Uh, for those of you who maybe who are interested or would like to uh, sign up, uh, just a quick reminder, the next edition of the course starts on May 9th. So um, if you want to sign up, you have all the information in your dossier or at our website, and do not hesitate to contact us about any details or questions or doubts that you might have. Um, so just like um, you could see in the video, the course is structured into four molecules, and we begin with pastry molecules, um, with four modules, and we begin with pastry molecules. We then move on to pastry techniques, and after studying this theoretical part during uh, quite a few weeks, 
we have. Mm -hmm. uh, we move on to um, first recipe formulation and then pastry creations. So there's this big uh, theoretical base, knowledge base that we, um, that we get during the first months of the course. And later, after five, six months, you, um, you have the fourth module, which is the pastry creations uh, that you can do at your own time um, during the rest of the 12 month access period. Um, in the first mo module, we focus on molecules, all the molecules we talked about today, but today we just touched really the surface in those videos and in this, um, uh, in this part, uh, the first module, we really dive deep into the molecular structure, uh, physical, chemical, and functional properties of each molecule, water, lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, sugars, um, starch, and fiber. We need to understand all of them in order to create the texture, no? In order to create the texture as we explain them, no? We start understanding the molecules. Once we understand the molecules, we understand the ingredients, no? Like butter, no? For example, we, if we understand fats and we know that inside of butter we have fats and inside of fats, we have different fatty acids, unsaturated, saturated, unsaturated. We can understand how to change or how to transform the recipes. No, if we don't understand molecules, it's not possible. No, for this reason, at the beginning, I, I, I remember like four years, five years ago that we were explaining ingredients at the beginning, no, mm -hmm. related to the techniques. But one day, there, we under, one day we understood that we were no, start to explaining the molecules, no, explain water, explain proteins, explain fats, because they are ingredients that are very important if everything that in everything that we do in basically, and then move to the ingredients and, and techniques, no, and for this reason we start explaining water, proteins, fats, fibers that exactly. are the future of, of pastry, pastry. <laughs> as uh, you can read on our blog as well. Protein, proteins know that they are really important to create the structures and once we understand this we can move to explain the techniques no and in, understand the interaction between all these molecules that we are using that's right Jordi. and maybe just a quick um incision because there are some questions regarding the course so i think those ones we can answer now not waiting till the yeah. uh, till the okay. end because in the end we will maybe answer more technical questions regarding flan and or meringues or uh, shoe pastry uh, so erika was uh, asking us if oh, well she, she was just commenting that she, that she like she took the um presential course the on-site course but the online course looks more complex and adrian was actually oh it's sylvia actually she's asking us um because she commented in the beginning uh, hello sylvia from poland you remember yes. her from prague yes. um that she was asking us if this has the same program that the master class of jordi in prague in 2019 no it's like 10 times <laughs> the content i mean um, we love the on-site courses, but within the four days, we can only explain so much. And this is the, the online course we've been, um, we've been doing, uh, we've been actually filming it, preparing the content for over a year and we've been shooting it for, for one year. So actually it has, um, 200, something like 200 videos, 500 pages of theoretical dossier and then the on, recipes on courses were a small part of what we are doing now. exactly the, the thing is that when pandemia raver no we were thinking okay now we are, we are we are going to start to work online but we are going to start for the very beginning that means that we cannot explain just a little bit uh, molecules just a little bit uh, techniques just a little bit formulation because this was the, the thing that we can do in four days, let's go to explain everything that we need to explain in molecules, everything that we have to explain in techniques and then move to the uh, uh, formulation side part and explain all the families that we have inside in, in pastry, no? And, and this was our opportunity in order to increase the quality of of the of the course no and for this reason on site courses we'll come back we'll come back next year but we'll come back completely different no because we need you know a part of introduction no for, no for this of introduction to the big concept and then if you want you can increase your knowledge uh, doing this online course and also we are going to create we think yeah, now, we, we think that we are going to create uh, 
uh, experience of four day course for the people that did the online course and they want to bring to the practice all that we explain no, in, in the online course and then the time no, in four days you cannot absorb all the quantity of knowledge that we share mm. now and that we have on the course now we have like uh, no, today no. we didn't bring it here but really like also before i saw a question about do we recommend some book with you know with a lot of theoretical knowledge well we would recommend the dossier from our course online course because it's really it's 500 pages full of um full of theoretical knowledge on molecule on pastry molecules on pastry techniques and on how to formulate your own recipes um so i hope this clears uh, your doubts a little bit both for erica and for sylvia and for anyone else that um that needs this information um really just to just to just to explain i think um just the fact that we need one year now that we give you one year to complete this online course shows that it's much more complex than the four day course mm -hmm. because uh, taking the opportunity of being able to of making it online we really put everything that we ever wanted to into this I think course. Alana, that we can explain how it works no mm -hmm. you enroll to the course and okay first day what we are start explaining no what 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 is exactly the day by day of the course day by day of the course of the online course yes. I mean, of course um so uh, from starting from the new editions every week you will get a mail uh, telling you to watch for example videos on uh, pastry molecules of water and then you will have recommended reading on water and also like 20 pages from the dossier and then you have also the bibliography if you want to go deeper dive deeper into any of this topic we recommend let's say 10 uh, pastry books or science articles regarding the the subjects that we are talking about in those videos so like this you study week by week you study and then by the end of this week you also have the self-evaluation test on water molecule then the next week let's say you have uh, you're studying lipids then proteins and like this um you will complete the first the first module on pastry molecules now then come the techniques where uh, on top of the videos with where the videos become much uh, much longer because we also incorporate start incorporating recipes into videos so for each technique you have five or six practical videos showing you how to apply the emulsification technique how to apply the gelling technique how to apply the the thickening technique in a recipe right so you have the theoretical explanation you have um you will have for example two weeks because those videos are are longer now you will have uh, two weeks for each technique so to study emulsification you will watch all the videos you will have the reading um, this again self-evaluation tests so like this with the molecules between the molecules and the techniques you continue um, for for a couple of months and together with the formulation recipe formulation module it's actually I think between five to six months of guided learning where every week you will you will receive a reminder of which videos to watch which content to read which uh, where to look for additional information and during all this time you also have um, a very important thing you have the thematical forums where you can practice ask your questions and where the the instructors team ariadna paula myself and jordi are always there um to help you solve your your doubts about the videos you watch about your own your own recipes and just one question Adriana. thinking of the experience that we have now that we have more than four 450 ingredients uh, 50, 50 students in our campus on yes. learning the decontent method how much time do you think that we have to invest every week in order to learn all this not because yes. sometimes it seems like wow <laughs> it seems like too so, much uh, like a very scientific course you're right Jordi um but we have we've had students who actually work full-time and you know that working full-time in pastry or in restaurants it doesn't it's not really 40 exactly it's not really 40 hours it's closer to 60 and maybe sometimes even for some chefs 70 hours a week so um that's why we with with the experience of previous editions we kept making um 
longer. Now we kept giving you a little more time to assimilate all this knowledge. Before, for example, we were giving our students three days for, for water molecules because maybe we thought, oh, the videos are short, so maybe they don't need all this time. But we realized that between the reading, the videos, and, and maybe even some practice, they need some hours. I think that uh, it's, it's really, mm, I, I think it would be fair to say that if you can dedicate um, 10 hours a week to the course right now how it's structured you can really um you can really take advantage of the content you can really assimilate the content and you can feel confident about your progression without feeling like oh i'm falling behind so mm -hmm. if you can find 10 hours a week to study um i think you can you can follow perfectly well those free um those free modules after which you have um you have actually completed maybe your um, your pastry goal because the, the the reason why students apply for this sign up for our course is to make their own recipes and we just want to show you uh, share with you uh, some examples of our previous students from the online course um, after they completed those free modules what did they learn and what uh, kind of elaborations they were able to uh, to make so we have uh, apricot cream peach um, and coriander uh, apricot peach and coriander actually creamy sorry there's a little mistake in the um in the title uh, made by uh, martin celeri from one of the editions that just um just finished a couple of weeks ago and it's really yes it's really beautiful and it makes us very emotional and very uh, proud to see how he was able to to create this recipe from scratch the uh, apricot peach and coriander creamy completely formulated from zero after after completing the three modules. Next, we have a carrot uh, and orange gelé from Edan Leshnik. Edan is a student also from our second edition, I think, who visited us uh, yeah. quite recently, oh. has an amazing uh, bakery, <laughs> um, bakery in New York and works at an amazing uh, bakery in New York. And he made this filling for the um right for the puff pastry mm -hmm. and it looks really amazing and it was also um basically the right a very proud moment for us to see that after that this was something that he was able to uh to do after the free uh, modules and last but not the least we have some pineapple and mango compote from Igor Sverlov, also a student who recently graduated, uh, one of the, our online editions. And you can see it in application, right? It's in a tart, I think it's in a sablé tart and with the whipped ganache or, or whipped cream on top. Um, so another example of what our students are able to do after completing those theoretical, but also highly practical, let's say, uh, free, first three modules. And then we get to the fourth module, which is also interesting if you're looking to to expand your recipe, right? The recipe profile. If you want to to learn recipes, yeah. Jordi's recipes. Here we created like twelve products that we use for explain different examples of creation of recipes. No? For example, we have a Paris dress that we explain how to create a perfect creamy in order to pipe and have a perfect stability. Or we have, for example, choco coco where we are working with a chocolate bean to bar that we create ourselves with coconut sugar and we explain step by step how to how to build the, this coverture and then how to transform this coverture in a creamy, in a mousse, in a sponge. And we use like th these 12 different products with uh, so many different kinds of textures and ingredients that we can find in pastry, dairy products, chocolates, nuts, uh, fruits, acidic fruits, non-acidic fruits, and all of these products we use for explain uh, different examples of what we can do using uh, the concept method, no? And, and this is, you know, we can have pretty simple recipes and then uh, more complex uh, products, no? Like for example, macadamia or ferro that are uh, products that has more layers, more different texture. One is vegan ferro, and here we explain how to create this kind of recipes, vegan recipes, no? And how to to make it, no? Exactly, and someone was asking about the gluten-free um, shoe, pa uh, shoe pastry, right? So we have the chocolate pari breast yeah. as one of the elaborations that you can uh, learn to make during the, this part of the course. So if you need more information about the course, you can find it all 
um, you can find it all in the dossier and also on our website. But just to finish, maybe we can share uh, just to put the dot over the <laughs> uh, just to, to put the dot over the eye. Um, some testimonials that by our former students um, that really I think they explain best what is the course about or what it actually uh, did for them in terms of their pastry work. So uh, we have a testimonial from Anna Junkal. Um, Thank you. Yes. Um, who said that for this course, you not only understand the reasons behind everything, something we were trying to show you today, but that happens in pastry, you also learn a different way of conceptualizing desserts. Um, this is the goal of the course, so that you can make your own desserts. Um, and Sanja, I can see, is asking us, is it possible to do the online course not being a professional chef? We also have testimonials, I think maybe not today, but we have testimonials of people who have never studied pastry before who decided to make the online course and they did it and they they made amazing final uh, this, is the, this is the reality of when you explain something that is new for everybody i mean in a lot of courses always no even on the on-site courses we had so many professional people that has like 20 years experience no in in the pastry world and then on the same group we have we have it uh, people that start in pastry, no? And for all of them, are, the language is new. What we explain is new. The way to create the recipes is new for all of them, no? That means that when you are a professional, maybe you are going to understand faster what we explain. But in this case, we are working online. You have time to read another time, to see another time the video. and. So ask all the questions, all the questions that you want in the in the technical forums. We really have um, students asking us as many questions, and many many times they are oftentimes they are shy. They say like, I don't know if it's a if it's a valid question. And we always say like, there's not no, no such thing as an invalid question. Sometimes maybe if they ask us something completely out of the pastry <laughs> world which happened we answer okay but uh, we don't really have expertise in that but whatever concerns pastry elaborations pastry molecules and pastry techniques we will be here to guide you and to to answer and resolve all of your doubts so the advantage just like Jordi said is because we start with pastry molecules it doesn't matter if you have years of you know of making um bonbons with ganache for <laughs> for a chocolate shop or if you're just if you just like to learning so um, it's really if you want to study if you are interested in really understanding and then creating one day your own recipes you can start with our course because we teach you from the very beginning from the water molecule of what and why uh, behind pastry uh, creations and pastry elaborations. So um, two last uh, testimonials that we will share before moving to our practical um, case, the flan. Uh, a testimonial from Carola Banyuls, um, who also describes the B-Concept online course that um, as something that cannot be compared to any other course. It's not only about learning to make healthier pastries, it's about learning to create recipes from scratch. And I think that's really, <laughs> um this is this is why our students sign up because they want to make their own recipes and we are we cannot be happier when we actually see them do it and some of them we always ask them to stay in touch and send us some recipes that they um that they are doing or or to show us like how can they how, how they implemented the knowledge gain throughout the course in their day-to-day -day work and uh, last but not the least a testimonial from tamara vinas um, by knowing the properties of each ingredient, you became capable of substituting different ingredients, knowing when and in what percentage is possible to, to add or remove a given ingredient. This is a big question for everyone who wants to do recipe substitutions, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, basically the, without studying for many weeks, <laughs> um it's really impossible to do this we have questions about substitutions all the time in those master classes and we always say okay, and they always start can i substitute this for this and we always answer yes but you have to keep this in mind and this in mind and this in mind so in this course we 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 take our time to explain to you and to understand all the parameters that interact in our recipes that exactly. are a lot of parameters that we need to understand and control 
Exactly. So Sanja, I think I hope we answered your your doubt. If you're interested in in pace, in science behind pastry, uh, feel free to take a look at uh, to, um, to keep, check our website and where you can find even more detailed syllabus of the course. And um, now moving on to the second part of our of our master class analysis of a flan. Um, recipe, a traditional one and a classic one. Let's start, Jordi, with the basics. Let's talk a little bit about what actually is a flan, <laughs> because a classic pastry recipe, no? Yeah. But what what else? If if we look if we look at a flan from this traditional perspective, I think that we would um, we would always we have to say that are not so beautiful, but are two flans. No? One yeah, so one... we had some problems now during the break. Just. <laughs> taking them out of their molds and because we were rushing they don't look as as pretty as we would have liked but uh but when we will cut into them you will see the creamy flan texture which is the uh, key the texture and the taste we can it's, say that are amazing but then... yes just the unmolding in a hurry will uh, was not uh as good but if we if we cut into this one we will be able to see a perfectly nice creamy texture i hope and the I other one the yes the one exactly creamy. exactly okay <laughs> so um we can answer to this question saying like a flan obviously it's a basic pastry recipe it's a basic um, pastry texture no but it's more than that if we understand pastry molecules and if we understand pastry techniques actually the the most simple answer is a flan is a gel mm -hmm. and and we will talk about how understanding this uh, helps us create any flan recipe that we want an eggless flan recipe a vegan flan recipe um any no lactose free flan recipe just by knowing what is your your recipe no what which techniques are implied in this recipe we can create a new one a new version but first we always have to understand very well what are we dealing with now. So I think, Jordi, that we will start with the traditional flan. And um, if, um, if you could explain. Yeah, yes, yes, for sure. First, what we need to understand is what we have inside, no? what kind of ingredients and what, what they are doing, the ingredients on that recipe. No? And if we go to the classic recipe, the first ingredient that we have is cream. Inside of cream, we have, we have water, no, that is going to help us to balance the recipe. We, we can say that all of the textures that we create in pastry is a balance between dry extract or the dry part of the ingredients and water. And here in, inside of this cream, we have water that will help us to balance this quantity of water and dry extract on that recipe. Then we have fat. Fat is going to give us creaminess. It's going to give us dry extract on the recipe. This is going to give us uh, stability. And then also we have ingredients, dry ingredients that they are going to give us thickening, no? like the proteins, fats that we have inside. Then if we go to the proteins, there is, there is like no uh, ingredients that are super important here, no, are, are uh, the heroes of pastry, as you say. Yes, always, super no? heroes. Super yes. heroes. That are the, um, the proteins that we have, in this case, casein, that will help us to emulsify. In this case, we are speaking about proteins that they are going to help us to create an emulsification that is very important in order to have, for example, a perfect creaminess on the, on the, on the flan, no? is like that no we have cream we have water we have fat we have proteins it's everything that we need to understand you know, on cream we have emulsification capacity we have aeration capacity also on cream if we whisk the cream we are going to introduce air inside through the the fats that they are going to help us to stabilize the air inside then if we if we move in milk is something similar, but with less quantity of fat, we can say that in milk we have a small percentage of fat that works on the similar way. We have proteins that helps us to emulsify, and we have water also another kind that helps us to balance the recipe. Then we have vanilla, vanilla perfect. We are going to use a vanilla in order to have the taste, and we are going to use also the fat that we have on cream, on milk, on egg, 
on eggs, on, on yolks, in order to spread these flavors that we have in vanilla. Then we have eggs inside of the eggs. We have proteins that are very important, as we explained it, for example, in a meringue. But here, eggs, they are going to play a, a really important uh, roles because we are going to set, we are going to create a gel by using these proteins that we have on the eggs and also on the on the yolks. Yolks are very really rich on fat, on water, and on proteins. And next, they are eggs, they are really rich in water, in proteins, and also we have a small quantity of fats of the of the yolks. That means that eggs and yolks they are going to work as a, a structure. They are going to give us a structure in this flan. No, that means that when we mix all the ingredients and we bring to the oven, no. Uh, what we do is, little by little, we uh, set all these proteins that we have exactly. inside, and this uh, together with fat and the techniques that we are using, we are going to create a perfect creaminess. No? And then we have sugar, sugar that is going to give us sweetness uh, by extract on the recipe and the structure. And also, we don't have to forget that inside of eggs and yolks, we have lecithin another emulsifier that's going to play the role of uh, emulsion, no? and to bring together the fat and the water that we have in that recipe. That, that means that we have like two kinds of emulsifiers, the casein that we have on the daily products, and then the lecithin that we have on the yolks. If we, if we think about the techniques here, we have like gelation, the most so, important no, let's yes. we could see that here emulsification and gelation are are, are the principal techniques and then mm -hmm. comes also the, the thickening technique but if we answer that to the question what is a flan a gel <laughs> obviously gelation is very important to control it perfectly because if the gelation mm -hmm. is not good enough then we have uh, we have the the texture that did not set well mm -hmm. enough or that it's too set and too mm -hmm. hard a gel mm -hmm. a very hard gel are very unpleasant because they don't give us a creamy sensation a flan that is not creamy is not a flan jordy right mm -hmm. that's why we yeah. need we need not only just the presence of egg yolks now the fat or the cr the presence of, of whipping cream to to bring us this fatty creamy nice sensation but we also need a perfect gelation a perfect degree of gelation if we use too much um, eggs, for example, in a flan, or too much, specifically too much egg whites, because egg, egg whites and egg yolks gel and set right in a, a little, there's a difference of temperatures and there's a difference of a, of a kind of a gel they make. So if we um, go overboard with the egg whites, for example, we will have a hard gel that will be more like rubbery. It will not be creamy. So I think here the gelation technique really is, um, is the key. And mastering the gelation technique now with all the steps of the elaboration process is, is key. Just, just a moment ago, you talked about sugar, right? And mm -hmm. its role. One of the role of sugars in this recipe is also controlling the setting, the coagulation of the, of the proteins. Okay. Because we know that um, some of the egg proteins coagulate at lower temperatures, not at 100 degrees that we have in the, in the water bath, right? But they... But adding sugar to the recipe, as well as other ingredients, actually makes the coagulation temperature rise. So with all of this, all the ingredients have the, the purpose here. And it's, mm. it's really important to, to understand this purpose, that it's not just a random, <laughs> let's say, random process of, OK, eggs, and here yolks, and here sugar. Now, each of these ingredients um helps us build this this wonderful creamy texture but we have to understand how if we are to replicate it or reformulate it in any way mm -hmm. then another thing that we have to know about this classic recipe is that we have different kinds of fat we have saturated and saturated no because inside of cream we have fats and it's a mix of uh, unsaturated and saturated, but the bigger, the biggest part is saturated. And if we are going to replace the recipe, that means that if we want to replace and create a new recipe, a, a flan, no, in this case, the goal was to create a vegan flan with hazelnut, we have to understand that we will need to work with different techniques. We will need to work with a balance of dry extract. We will need to work with a kind of fats 
on the recipe in order to have a similar structure as a flan. No? And here, what we did was to work with, for example, coconut sugar. In this case, in general, we try to work with healthier pastry. That means that we reduce the sugar on the on the textures. Uh, this recipe maybe is on the limit. No, that means that maybe you need a little bit sugar, but we are thinking that this vegan flan is always with caramelized sugar, and that means that both ingredients are going to balance between them. That means that coconut sugar is five five percent here. That give us a stability and dry extract and sweetness. Then we use it agar agar as fiber in order to replace the capacity of uh, of the eggs that we have in order to set no. And we are working with agar agar that is a fiber. We are going to go. We, we are working with war gum that is a fiber that cuts water and give us the capacity to control the water and give us also a structure and creaminess, for example. Then we have water. On the first recipe, we are not working with water, but here we need to work with water or maybe, for example, we can replace this water for any... Uh, any uh, plant-based plant milk, plant -based right? Milk. Like it's uh, here in Spain, it's not permitted to say milk, so it's, it's called like plant-based drink but uh, in English we still I think say plant-based milk and we could perfectly use hazelnut milk rice milk or, almond example. milk uh, oat milk whichever uh, whichever we choose and it will be equally interesting then we have cacao mass and uh, hazelnut puree that means that these two ingredients are the ingredients that brings us the fat to the recipe to, in order to build the, the creaminess on, on that flan. And here we have also the same example, uh, saturated fatty acids with unsaturated fatty acids. Saturated fatty acids comes from the cacao butter that we have inside of cocoa mass. And then we have puree toasted of hazelnut paste that is really rich in, in unsaturated fatty acids, no? and this is a balance that this will help us in order to create this creamy, this creamy texture. And at the end, one emulsifier, because on the classic recipe, we have casings, we have lecithin from the yolks, but here the goal was to create a vegan flan, and here we were using a granulated lecithin or lecithin in powder in order to create a perfect emulsion and perfect creaminess also on the um, on the on the on the flan, no, and you can see it, almost same techniques, no, completely different ingredients, uh, similar texture, similar stability, different in this case, different flavors because we are working with a classic flavor or chocolate uh, hazelnut flavor. Exactly, Jody. That's the magic. That somehow we we re we are able to recreate the creaminess. We are able to recreate the flan look, but using no co completely different ingredient just by understanding that we need gelling no and that we need to to create a creamy gel no because obviously we could say okay a flan is a gel so i will just make a i don't know a raspberry flan and just put uh, raspberry puree and gelatin but would it then it wouldn't really have the the flan texture right we couldn't call it a raspberry flan uh, so just by understanding and analyzing the classic and uh, the classic recipe understanding that it is a gel that is also creamy that it's also now also has this emulsification part because um creaminess basically comes from emulsification um so we we, we really get to create something new something very different something exciting for us because a, a vegan flan recipe is exciting um just really analyzing first learning about the ingredients the particular role understanding the egg proteins understanding the the lecithin role understanding how the gel is made and that we need water to gel for example for me i think the big shock for anyone who looks at this uh, this big concept vegan flan recipe is just seeing 76 percent of water gel. for me this is shocking that with so much water you can create a texture that is actually creamy that is gelled <laughs> that resembles a flan and and you're thinking Oh my God, I'm using, I'm using water. This is 76% of water, no? Mm -hmm. But when we know that actually any gel needs water, any gel is in large part water. This is water trapped in a, in a 3D network. Then it stops being shocking. Then we just understand that in the traditional flan, this water is brought by 
not just milk, not just cream, but even egg whites. <laughs> and that in this case, we just replace it with pure water. And as just like Jordi said, we could replace it with other um, other watery ingredients. No, but uh, I think this is this is an example of um, how you can use this knowledge gained through studying pastry molecules and pastry techniques to really reinvent, uh, create your own recipes according to your needs, whether vegan, lactose free, gluten free, um, free of sugar, which whichever direction you want to go. Um, towards, you can make your recipes, just understanding all of this. Then we move to the comparative. No? We can see that the, the, the process are pretty uh, different. different no? mm. The classic process, we blend all the ingredients, we emulsify all the ingredients, and we cook little by little. We, we cook little by little on the vine marie, but then then we we are going to move to the to the hazelnut flan with cacao with chocolate. And here, what we did is something completely different, no? Completely different because we are working with agar agar. We are using agar agar in order to set the structure. And here, what we did is there is no cooking process. It's just we blend all the ingredients. We no, no, sorry. Because of we, agar agar, we, we do have. We um, boil uh, agar agar. There's with, no baking process. We no, can say. <laughs> there's no baking. Yes, we boil agar agar uh, with wargam, agar agar coconut sugar, and then we emulsify with cocoa pas and and and, and hazelnut paste. And here we emulsify. Then we put inside of the shape with a little bit of caramel, cool down, and then just you can turn off and remove and you have the, the texture of flan, no? And you see, just working by different ingredients, different process, we have completely two different uh, flavors with similar structure and simple process, no? That is also, this is so interesting to, to understand. And if we compare one structure to one product to the another product, we can say that dry extract, for example, on the classic recipe, we have like 33%. That means that it's not a high percentage of dry extract, but, but we can say that the less dry extract we have, easier is the digestion process when we eat something. Then we have the concept recipe that has to 20, 23% of dry extract, easier to digest. If we compare the fats, we have the classic recipe that has 9% of fats. And here the concept recipe has 11% of fats. Why? Because we are working with a hazelnut and cocoa mass that they are really rich in fat. Here we have to say that we enrich the recipe with unsaturated fat that is better and more interesting for health parameters of the recipe. Then we have fibers. Uh, the classic recipe has no, Practically almost, no, fiber, I don't no fibers. On the concept recipe, we have 2%. Added sugars, we have 15%, and on the Biconcept recipe, we have 4.5, around 5% of added sugars. We have to say that this is not so sweet. I think that this can be perfect, for example, for the Chinese market. Yes. They don't understand For sweetness. Asian market, for some Asian countries yeah, in yes. general. But the then if we move, for example, for America, I think that we have to put two times the sugar that we have, no? Uh, we have 5% of coconut sugar, we can move to 10% in order to have uh, sweetness related to the necessities that we have on the market. Then we have sweetness points, this comes related to the quantity of sugars that we have. Here we are working with saccharose, coconut sugar is quite uh, similar sweetness, and, and we have 16 points on the classic recipe, uh, 472, five points of sweetness on the concept recipe. Then the calories, that is a, a, a small difference, we have uh, less calories on the concept recipe because we are working with less dry extract, Let's try extract in general fibers, uh, proteins, fats, sugars. They are the ingredients that give us calories in our recipe. The, the less we use and the more we use water, more we reduce the, the calories inside. And, and here you can see the, the difference. And I think no, that, that's it, Adriana. We can start 
answering Asking the, the, questions. the questions. Okay, let's see if there will be also some new questions about this, this flan recipe in particular, because you've already asked us questions regarding the previous pastry elaborations that we, uh, that we talked about. So um, let's start with the first question. I, I have to say the first question is quite puzzling. Um, it concerns uh, removing the bitter taste of cooked sparkling wine in champagne ganache. And I have I to say, <laughs> say that we don't work that much with alcohol, even though we have a special section in the course, a uh, recipe. Yes, cooked sparkling, sparkling wine. wine. But I think, um, I think here uh, I would really recommend you to read one of Francois Chartier's book okay. on uh, um, mo aromatic molecules, because I think the bitter taste here doesn't come from you know, it's not related to any pastry technique, let's say. I think it's related to the breaking down of aromatic molecules and then changing into some bitter, um, bitter maybe components. Because uh, I know <laughs> that the world of alcohol now, and I know Francois Chartier is a specialist of wine. So we, we do recommend you check one of his, uh, he has many books uh, about aromatic molecules because maybe there you can find the answer to this question because we have to say that um, we do not work that much with sparkling wine and even less with, with cooked wine. Um, then there are questions regarding the meringue. So Jardi, would you like to, to start with this one? Erika, what about the pasteurized egg whites? Uh, they usually don't whip that much as fresh egg whites. Why is that? Uh, when we have pasteurized egg whites uh, for use in a recipe, what's happening is that uh, for pasteurized, they, we can see that they kill a little bit uh, the capacity of the proteins to whip up. And, and for this reason, in general, when we are using pasteurized egg whites, the, the merengue is softer and we can have like even less volume in our merengue. No, what happened here in order to, to find a solution here is one solution is to add, for example, albumin inside of uh, egg white powder inside of Which the merengue. Which is perfect because it's the second, I don't know if you've seen, it's yeah, the second yeah. part of her question. Yes. So this is the explanation for, for the other question as well. That means that if we think that in egg whites we have around 11% of proteins, uh, we can add until 10% sometimes of egg white proteins in powder in order to increase the capacity to whip up of these egg whites. No, the solution is always, no, we use pasteurized egg whites. They are not so well pasteurized because what happened is that uh, you can find, uh, you can find really good quality of egg whites and you can find really bad quality. No? That means that when you have like bad quality that has not uh, a strong uh, capacity to introduce air inside, here what we are going to do is to introduce more protein in order to increase this capacity that we lose it on the pasteurization process. And here in general, uh, cream of tartar, we have to use less quantity, no? When we use, for example, um, fresh egg whites, cream of tartar or an acid is really important in order to have flexibility when we're going to use this meringue and mix with other parts of the recipes. When we use uh, pasteurized egg whites in general, even sometimes we don't need to add because they are quite flexible because the proteins are are in in a part they are they a little lose. damaged like they lose you can say that in the pasteurization yeah. process no like some part of them will always get uh, get a little get cut get damaged and this will result in let's say in a less um propensity to be to be over whipped during the the whipping process and about the second question erika is still no when we have egg whites that are pasteurized that they lose the capacity to whip up uh, in a strong way the way to you know, to you know, repair this situation is to add egg protein inside in order to have more proteins with good quality and create a, a perfect network that is going to trap the air inside of our meringue and another question, Shona asked us, I, I think it's a very interesting question. Does the, um, should we add, basically, should we add acid to aquafaba meringue too? And I like this question because um, it also goes back to the equivalence. No, the proteins that we found in aquafaba and the proteins that we find in, um, in egg whites are different. And actually the 
agent responsible for weeping is different. It's, so um, there is, um, it is an often process that we add a little bit of acid to aquafaba, but actually it's more because of the color or the aftertaste. When we work with liquid aquafaba, I've seen many recipes. We we personally don't do it. We just put aquafaba to whip and and it also, it whips, uh, it needs more whipping time than the egg white. So actually the risk of over whipping aquafaba, I don't I think, minutes, exactly. Eh? I, I have yet, I think to see an over whipped aquafaba but when you add the acid to aquafaba you just you often make the let's say the meringue a little whiter and you make it you make it let's say some little aftertaste that you might have you might want to make it disappear or neutralize it with the part of acid because you have to think that the acid in the egg whites it is specifically targeting a certain type of covalent bond between certain amino acids so it's it's very uh, we would have to know the, the the amino acids of aquafaba to actually know if if this has this exactly same um same effect but i would say that you don't need to worry about it because aquafaba can be whipped and not doesn't get over whipped that easily um Again, about the question about for Erica about the gluten-free shoe pastry. Um, well, just like we said, we do have we, we we do have a recipe for shoe pastry. It's part of our uh, course elaborations, and it is possible <laughs> to make a shoe pastry. So if you're making trials at, at home or at your pastry shops, do not despair. And it is it is possible. You just have to. Um, keep experimenting in order to get to our recipe. I know we've tried so many uh, gluten, gluten free, different gluten free flours, but especially different starches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, yeah, so it's okay. really, and it took a lot of, uh, a lot of tests to, to actually end up with this, with this final recipe, but it and is the, follow. The final recipe, I, I, had, I think that was rice flour, and then we worked it with two different starches, Adrian, I think. Um, yes, right now, I, I really don't remember. We would have to, we would have to get into the, the course content to check it for you, because there were so many tests yes. that, that we got a little mixed, but I, I, I myself, I remember I did the test with potato starch and then with tapioca starch just to just to see the differences now and here another time we have to explain now that when you remove for example flour with flour from the uh, pasta too we are removing proteins that they have the capacity to give us a structure to set the water that we have now on the on the pasta patacho and then if we have to replace we have to replace with an ingredient that also is going to set for this re reason we've been using uh, starches in order to have a balance but was a balance between i think tapioca starch and corn starch but I, i'm not sure okay but the reason was that no we need to set the water in order to have a perfect structure it was and was a balance between rice flour i think potato starch or tapioca starch and and with um and and it starts from uh, my uh, corn starch corn starch, corn starch. sorry Jody. i got i also forgot um just going back to shana's question for just for a second right. thank you shana for uh for still being with us and listening actually in aquafaba um also the thing is there is part of protein but there's the the actually foam the actual foaming agent in aquafaba is not that much the protein if not the saponins that are present in aquafaba so this is also another reason why why here the mechanism of creating the meringue is very different than the um, than in the case of the egg white meringue so if you want to get um, dive deeper into the subject i recommend either reading about saponins or um or signing up for our course and where we i i believe we have one one entire video kind of uh, related just to uh just to aquafaba and moving on with the questions um a question about a vegan or at least gelatin free glaze can we replace gelatin with nh pectin yes for sure um, or agar agar when we are using fruit glazes, for example, we have to use pectin and ice because we are in acidic parameter, in, a, in acidic pH between 3 and 3.5. And here, pectin and ice works uh, so well. 
And then when we move to other glazes that are not acidic, like for example, chocolate glaze, vegan chocolate glaze, as we use on, on the course, here we are using pectin acid free from Sosa Company. Now that means that this pectin is a, is a pectin that can work without any specific parameter on pH because we have already calcium inside that activate the, the pectin. No? And, and for this reason, you have just to understand that one possibility with fruits is pectin and ash, one possibility, for example, with nut glazes or dark glazes with chocolate, uh, we have to work with pectin acid free. Agar agar, we did some tests, but it's not so interesting because agar agar doesn't have the same capacity to, to set like pectins. No, pectins are, are quite interesting as gelatin, mm -hmm. no, that are really, really different than, for example, the, the kind of a structure that we can have with agar agar. Mm -hmm. um, then another question about actually vegan <laughs> shoe pastry. I think uh, I think in order to answer this question well, we would really uh, we would really have to basically start right now developing with you theoretically a shoe pastry. But it's really complex, and actually uh, we have to say that if you successfully uh, elaborate a shoe pastry, a vegan shoe pastry recipe, please do share it with us because we would love to learn. We have yet to um, to to really develop a vegan shoe pastry recipe. So. Uh, obviously yeah. you are you are starting in a in a right way yes we would cook flour but um but maybe not with the oil maybe the oil would be added we would cook flour and starch and then add the um, the coconut oil or the olive oil or any vegetable oil you know but it's really um it's just like we said then you have to also think about adding the baking powder and you have to you have mm. to make many tests to 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 test which uh, which combination and which process would work for you. So for, for now, sorry, we cannot help um, help more in this matter, but please keep us posted if you if you succeed. And then Sylvia is asking us about the uh, meringue recipe. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, just Maria was looking because it says Adrian, but Sylvia in the beginning told us that she's connecting from her husband's uh, computer okay. and that oh, we yes. should keep in mind that it's her. Um, so that's, that's all right, Maria. Um, regarding meringue recipe, why do we sometimes, why are we advised to use one portion of egg whites and two portions of sugar and then um, at the end of the process even uh, add 100 grams of icing sugar? Wow, I almost think this is, this is a type of meringue because are, this is with what so we much. For example, with pavlova. No? Yes. And what we are doing, what we are doing here is at the beginning, we start to whisk the, whisk the whites and we start to introduce the sugar little by little, the quantity that is necessary in order to be sure that this sugar will uh, be melted really fast. And for this reason, we are adding uh, in a small quantities, we can say. And at the end, when all the sugar is melted, we add a huge quantity of uh, sugar in powder in order to fix all this structure and to have a lot of dry extract inside in order to in pavlova for example we are going to bake to pipe to bake it and when we bake all this this dough this meringue what we do is to recrystallize the sugar and for this reason we have a crunchy texture in pavlova we have like melted and creamy texture inside but in outside, what is in contact with the oven is completely, we can say, dry and crunchy. No? And this is because we have a huge quantity of sugar, we start to evaporate water of the surface of the, of the meringue. And what we do is to recrystallize the sugar and we have crunchy texture. This is something similar that what we have in macaron. When we pipe mm. macaron, we dry, and then when we put in the oven, what we are going to do is to recrystallize all the saccharose that we have inside. And for this reason, it's not possible to, to change the saccharose because at the end, macaron is, is what we have with sugar, also with almond, but the main ingredient in macaron is sugar because it's the ingredient that gives us the capacity to recrystallize and have this crunchy texture that we love in macaron. No? And we cannot work with fibers because fibers doesn't recrystallize as a sugar. We cannot work with, for example, glucose because we, glucose 
avoid the revitalization of sugar. And for this reason, we have to use saccharose in order to have this crunchy texture. Here, what we are, what we see in this process is that um, we introduce, we have water proteins at the beginning, egg whites that we start to whisk. Uh, the, we start to introduce air, we start to introduce sugar little by little, and here we, we are creating a structure uh, stable, and at the end we add a huge quantity of sugar in order to have this revitalization capacity and this structure on the, on the meringue. I also think that this adding of icing sugar, many many times we are wondering now why icing sugar instead of, of uh, crystal sugar, that it's when when we get to this size high sugar quantity now, mm -hmm. it's about the dissolving of sugar. The harder, the more sugar we have, the harder it is to dissolve it. So when in recipes that call for, in meringues that call for a high amount of sugar, it's all almost always we found, we find that we're actually working with, with icing sugar. We hope Sylvia that it, it helped you, you uh, resolve this doubt. Should you have any further doubt, please do not hesitate to write us whether, whether during the chat or, or privately, you know how to find us. And um, Marilla, um, Marilla has a question, another question regarding meringue. Um, when to add the cream of tartar when, um, while preparing the Italian meringue? Um, it's it's actually interesting. I'm not sure that on we the, need on the egg, on the egg, egg whites. whites. No, no. I I mean the, for the cream of tartar, it's it's quite sure that on the egg whites because if you add the acid to the sugar syrup, you might actually create mm, the invert syrup, sure. invert sugar. So um, so definitely not to the you wouldn't add it to the uh, sugar. But um, I also think that usually with the Italian meringue, I'm not we sure if use, we don't use the cream of tartar. It's not. Uh, the whipping, I, the whipping is, is yes. um, so, oh, shorter sure, time. And, yes, we, we start to whisk a little bit. When we start to have volume, we add the syrup. And in that moment, for the quantity of dry extract that we add, in general, we have uh, flexibility and we don't need to use um, cream of tartar. But anyway, if you want to use it, mix with the egg whites at the beginning when you are going to whisk the egg whites. It's, uh, it's with the ingredient that has to interact now because what we want to avoid is the over whipped of the egg whites. And for this reason, we need the cream of tartar on the egg whites and not on the syrup. Uh, then Pulke is asking us, do we have any plant-based alternative of egg white powder? Yes and no. Uh, there is no substitution for egg or egg white powder. Uh, eggs are really like those amazing ingredients that um, are yet to be, you know, replaced by anything. We do have aquafaba in powder that you can use, okay, for for whipping also for making meringues. So if you're into plant-based vegan alternatives, you can look into that. But we have to admit to you, like plainly, it will never have, the meringue will never have the same uh, strength, the same structure as the meringue made with egg white powder or simply egg whites. It's much less stable when you add solids like flowers or when you add fat, you can see how a plant-based proteins or aquafaba like, kind of like collapse like the meringue collapses a little bit no to, to a lesser or or higher degree depending on the ingredients so these are the ingredients we do use in our vegan recipes in our course we have the whole uh, lesson dedicated to vegan mousses so you have um, you have recipes there um, that you can follow however we cannot lie we, we will not lie it's not exactly the same as egg white powder or egg white uh, then Sherin mentioned, um, asked us to, to specify uh, the meringue with erythritol, like how do, um, how do we heat the, the erythritol? Actually, we don't heat that much the erythritol. It, we just keep heating. We put the egg whites, we start foaming them, no? and then we add the sugar and we, with, a, with a heat Heating gun, them. yes, with a heat gun, we, we go around a little bit. If you don't have a heat gun, you can basically even almost use a hairdryer or something like something like this. And we just keep heating the ball from outside, but being careful because a stainless steel ball mm -hmm. gets can heat too quickly and you can actually make your proteins, egg white proteins set and coagulate too much. No? So, you are so this is how we would we would go checking the temperature with a the thermometer whether this is um 
whether the temperature is around 30 degrees. Around 30 degrees, it's already uh, erythritol does have a better solubility than at 20 degrees. And then um, Sylvia is, has one more question uh, regarding um, pastry cream and uh, creme anglaise. Uh, for the creme anglaise, we use egg yolks as a thickening agent. For the creme pâtissier, uh, we use egg yolks and the starch. We have to cook the starch because of its specification. What about the egg yolks in this situation? Because it's almost always said that we shouldn't achieve the temperature more than 20, 85 degrees. Is it thanks to the starch that we can go further than 85 degrees with eggs in case of creme pâtissier? Of course. Of course, that's exactly what we what we teach in in the course when we talk about about starches and also about um, about sugars, about everything. We explain how the molecules interact. So, for example, just like sugar, you now elevates the coagulation degree of of uh, whether it's uh, creme pâtissière or creme anglaise, no, um, to also starch you now prevents the, the 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 proteins to get together too closely or to set too fast so it intervenes you now in this proteic um, network and it it makes it you now it makes it possible to um, it makes it possible to cook it to a to a higher degree also if you we would have to see exactly the proportion and the other ingredients you now because um, because all of this plays a role but both here and here, we can say you are forming, you are coagulating the um, the eggs, but in a different way. No, and as you said, in a creme pâtissière, the the thickening comes um, not just from from eggs, but also from starch. I hope I answered your your question. Yeah. And we have one other masterclass, Sylvia. If you want to watch one free masterclass about where we did talk about creme anglaise and mm -hmm. creme pâtissière yes. uh, as a base. I think it's our uh, winter class on chocolate mousse, I think. This is in our blog. You can yes. find in our blog on the website. Here, Pulkit say uh, what kind of uh, fats we can, plant-based fats we can use to replace butter. Here is a, is a balance uh, between, for example, coconut oil, cacao butter, and for example, some flour oil or grapeseed oil or olive oil. You have a balance between all these fats in order to have a similar texture of butter in order to replace in your in your recipe. You know, that means that, for example, you can try 50% 50, 50 of coconut oil, 20% of cacao butter, and 30% of sunflower oil, and see what's happening in your recipe. Of the total fat that you are going to use in that recipe, use this percentage and try it. And you see, and you will see what's happened. No, uh, here we need we need to have flexibility, but it's not a it's not a really important no um, role. The flexibility maybe for the cooking process, but it's not so important. Here also, you have to be careful because if you have, for example, mo a lot of unsaturated fatty acids the patashu is not going to crystallize and then when we want to pipe uh, it's not possible to pipe because we don't have recrystallization of cacao butter or of butter of coconut oil for this reason is a is a more percentage of saturated fatty acids like cacao butter or coconut oil and then less quantity of for example sunflower oil olive oil almond oil uh, hazelnut oil any kind of unsaturated um, fat. Okay. Uh, I guess we reached the end of our questions for today, Jordi. We hope that you enjoyed the content. We hope that uh, it can serve you. Um, as always, we, uh, we invite you to check also our blog content, to check our website because you have much more information there. There are previous master classes that you can watch. And just a final reminder, should you be interested in signing up for our extended online B Concept Pastry course, uh, you can find all the information also at our website. The next edition, both in English and Spanish, starts on May 9th, so next week. But um, please don't worry, there's still some margin if, if some people want next to join weeks. during the uh, during the next weeks because they can always uh, catch up those, those first few weeks. And thank you so much for well, joining us today. All. Thank you very much. Uh, stay, uh, stay uh, healthy. Stay, healthy. Stay. <laughs> and we keep we keep in contact. Okay. Thank you very much. See you. See you bye soon. Bye bye.